when you play music, it absolutely controls behavior. So if it's music in, in the church, there's a certain kind of music that makes you feel reverential or closer to God. If it's in a disco, it may make you want to shake your booty, but it also might make you behave in ways that are called what we might consider antisocial, but also can be calming. So, you know, Plato writes about it, and Napoleon knew that it affected power, how we behave and how, how you can control society. So in Confucius' time in China, music was, was part of public administration. Think about that for a minute, right? Because it was something that controlled how people behave. So in the 20th century, which is the subject, the general area of my book, um, we're talking about dictatorship in which Mussolini, Hitler, and Stalin absolutely wanted to control behavior and therefore knew that they needed to control music. Okay, so that's the thing about music and its power. Because it's invisible, it has the capability of not knowing borders. It speaks out. It doesn't know where the border is. It doesn't know that Jews are locked up in the ghetto because the music can come out over the wall or under the wall or through the wall. Slaves show up and they start to sing, and the slave quarters are over there, but the people who are the enslavers hear that music. And again, if they like it, they're influenced by it. Now, the last part of this rather long answer to your simple question is, what is its vulnerability? Well, its vulnerability is, if you don't hear it, it's then dormant. You have to hear music to judge it. It's as simple as that. So, one of the things that was being done was, in this case, when music was um, inconvenient for certain powerful um, countries, they would take it away from the public discourse. That's harder to do today, but it was easier to do in the 1930s and certainly easier to do in 1917, for example, when the Metropolitan Opera did not perform Wagner just before America entered the war against Germany. But it's not just that they didn't play Wagner, they didn't play Beethoven's Fidelio at the Met either. Imagine that, Beethoven, who we look at as the great Democrat, the great person who loved humanity. You know, Alle Menschen werden Brüder, this guy who wrote that. They didn't play Fidelio because somehow it was believed that the spirit of the Hun was somehow embedded in the notes that were being played or sung. So, to answer your question, what about Italian music, Italian opera? And how you found that out? Yeah, how I found out was simple. <laughs> in my many lives, I was music director of an opera house in Italy, in Torino, or Turin, the Teatro Regio. And as the first, and I think still only American, to ever run an opera house in Italy, one day we were rehearsing Puccini's Turango, and uh, I was sitting with my staff over our pasta, and I said, hey, why do you think, first of all, I said, who's your favorite living Italian composer? And there was silence at the table. These are all musicians, gentlemen. There was no answer. It was a kind of, okay. I said, okay, then. so why do you think the last Italian opera to enter the repertory was written and not completed in 1924. And again, there was silence. And it was as if no one wanted or knew the answer. So that kind of sparked my, okay, I'm curious. So when I got back to New York, I went through um, the list of composers in the Groves Dictionary of Music to find Names of composers who, you know, Giordano, Alfano, the names of them must, uh, there just was all so many names. And I saw that their wives, you know, not only lived, they lived during Puccini's time, some were born before him, but they were writing operas well into the 40s. And many of them wrote 11, 12 operas. Mascagni, you know, we just know him from one opera, Cavalier Rusticana. I, I looked at this list and I, on my jaw dropped. I thought, wait a minute, and all of those operas have been performed 
They had been played in the greatest opera houses. Many of them had come to this country, like La Moye de Treve of, uh, of Montemezzi, conducted by Toscanini and then conducted by Montemezzi on a boy. What is that? So that, again, just to answer this rather long answer, but I started to think, well, that's very weird. Why is the cutoff point Puccini? Well, then there's only one answer to that one, which is that Mussolini came to power in 1922, right? Most people who know something about World War II and about the 20th century kind of think of Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini as being kind of the same, but there's a significant difference here because Mussolini became, uh, came to power in 1922, Hitler in 1933. So it's a long period of time in which Mussolini controlled Italy. And of course, in the fascist political system, everything is the state and the state owns everything. So that means that every composer who wanted their music published, who wanted a singer to sing on the stage, an orchestra player to play violin, uh, the publishing house, the composer, all of them had to be members of the fascist party or at least agree in principle to their philosophy. When the war was over, all of what happened in Italy is one of those really particularly terrible stories because the Italians decided to get out of the war early. They said, okay, we're out. But that didn't work very well because the Allies were busy doing something else. And, and Hitler said, well, wait a minute. You, you've signed an agreement with us. And the Nazis got in first. And they rounded up like a, mil a million Italians. They were shooting people in the piazza. They were putting people in concentration camps. It's the other story. Now, apparently, also famously written, people were throwing their pictures of the Duce out the window. And they were seemingly it was not a fascist to be found in Italy. Right? No one was a fascist. No one had been a fascist, right? So what happened when La Scala opened after the war? What happened at the Teatro Reggio? What happened in, in, in Venice? When those opera houses opened again, they could not play any music that had anything to do with the fascist time because it would be seen as a political act. So instead, they could go back to Turano, because Puccini died in 24, having been in two photographs of Mussolini, but never, if he had lived in a normal life, he died from an operation on his throat for throat cancer. It was a radiation treatment, and, and it didn't go well in Brussels. But if he had lived until 1940, which he could have, he would have been the number one fascist composer. We might be discovering La Boheme right now. I think about that for a minute. So that's how I knew that there was something afoot here that had nothing to do with aesthetics, but had everything to do with politics. John, tell me, tell me this though. Another thesis of the book is that there's all this beautiful music, approachable, complex, yet approachable music, that we don't get to hear, and that instead, in Italy and elsewhere, the new fashion was music that's very ear unfriendly to most people. So it might be a tonal, it might be 12 tone, it might be challenging in some other way such that it's only designed to appeal to a rather small set. And one thing I worry about in your book, not me, but I think about its reception by certain people out there, the chattering classes, is that you talk about how wonderful music has been replaced by music that almost nobody really wants to hear. And you refer to this as a problem that's still going on now. Whereas if a friend of yours, say, writes uh, an editorial about your book, what said friend, I'm not going to say who that is, hears on Twitter is that I am referring to a battle that's long gone over specifically 12-tone music, the serialist battle is over, and there's no point in talking today about the public being foisted with music that nobody wants to hear. I thought that was still a problem myself, whether it's all about Schoenberg or anyone else. What is the problem today? Instead of hearing beautiful post Verdian operas, instead of hearing beautiful music written by Russians who instead weren't allowed to have an heir after 1945, what do we hear today? What's the only music? Oh, the only music. Well, let me <clears throat> let just say a, a larger issue again. John asked me a question, and I, as they used to say, I, I was out. I go in the other direction just to answer it in a larger way. We all do that. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's right because fundamentally, I believe that you define great music 
by the music you love. And this only, that's the only way I can imagine you can actually define it. Because I can tell you forever how important a certain composer is. And if you don't like it, you're just going to say, you're going to find another reason. So you can either say, well, I just don't understand it, or I'm not smart enough for you. And by the way, that is the fundamental, you know, the way modernists, or what I call the, either the, the industrial avant-garde or the never-ending avant-garde, um, always answers things. Well, it takes a while for people to understand this, or you just don't imply it, you're not smart enough to like it. But that's not true. I think everybody knows everything you need to know about music. You do. You just don't maybe know the jargon. But again, it's about what you like. It can't be anything else. And telling somebody that you should like it because it's constructed like this, or justifying it because of how it was written, is interesting if you like it, or interesting even if you don't like it. So ugly music might be ugly for somebody, and somebody else finds it finds another word for ugly, which is maybe challenging. Uh, like the words of the you know the euphemism, right? Um, but here's the thing. Uh, and I want to correct something about Russian music. During the Soviet era, uh, this union of Soviet socialist republics involved a lot of countries. But it was really run out of Moscow. So if you were an Armenian composer, you had much less chance of people hearing your music. If you were a Ukrainian composer, you weren't part of the inner circle that was controlled by the group of Soviet Composers League. I mean, Kachaturian is the only Armenian who really made it into the central. So he was the most played composer during the, 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 the Soviet era, and his music was played in department stores, etc. Now you would almost never uh, come in contact with Kachaturian. Not um, in the department store. And not even in the department store. Uh, so, so this is, again, part of why I talk about the book saying there's so much music in the 20th century that does not come into the description that music should always get ever more complex, right? That that's what justifies its value. You know, when I was, when I was first encountering music, people were saying things, you know, the avant-garde, that by 1910, the tonal musical language had said all it needed to say. I mean, they're actually saying that, which would mean, <laughs> can you imagine saying that about theater or art or anything else? It's absurd, right? It's absurd. I mean, yeah, after Shakespeare, there was no need to write another play because he said everything that needed to be said. Um, and, and, and this was part of a kind of a game. Now, we can answer the question, if you ask it, about why that became the, the official language after the war. Because the start of this book was to answer a question that was asked me in the 1990s, which was John, to me, or Michael Haas, who was producing the records. Why is it that 50 years after the end of World War II do we not play the music that Hitler banned? And that is a pretty good question, which, by the way, is why I wrote the book. What role did the shape-shifting ear lens play in all of this? There's going to be some controversy over that from your book as well. What did well, that man do? How did he create this? I, mean, I, I don't, I don't mind. Listen, you know, there is a wonderful moment in a very late movie uh, in which um, uh, Maurice Chevalier uh, has a line, and he says something shocking, and the character says, I'm very sorry, but I'm very old now, and occasionally I say exactly what's on my mind. <laughs> And so at my age of 76, I'm thinking, okay, fine. So someone's going to say, you overemphasize Pierre Boulez's influence. I do not, which is why I, I list all the jobs he had, um, especially in this country. Um, and, and so Boulez is, is, the, is a little bit inexplicable to me why everybody listens to everything he said, because it, it's, that, is, that I have not solved. I can solve some of this you know, conundra of, 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 of the 20th century. But let's put it this way. Boulez was born in 1925. Okay, so just imagine that. You know, you're, you watch on television uh, 
video of Ukraine. Right? So just picture living in France, in Lyon. He's 12 years old, he's 15 years old, he's in Paris, while the Nazis are still marching in the streets and everybody has to have a special card, and he's studying music as an 18-year-old. Um, there's the bombing, there's the, everything going on, and he grows up to write a certain kind of music. He is a child of World War II, a war that he didn't create, but that he grew up in. Same thing with Stockhausen. I spend a lot of time on Stockhausen in the book, well, not a lot, but just to explain why after 9-11, he wrote that it was the greatest artwork imaginable. I mean, he said that, and it's quoted, it's recorded that Stockhausen's response to the destruction of the trade towers was, was to call it the greatest artwork imaginable. He had to quickly, you know, within 24 hours, try and say, oh, I didn't say that. I'm sure his publishers, Robert, were probably pretty horrified at the idea that no one would ever play comprehensive music again. But what he was saying made sense two ways. One, it has to do with something that happened in 1909, which is called the, um, the, the Futurist Manifesto. Right? And the Futurist Manifesto was published in France and in Italy and in Paris. And one of its tenets was to destroy things in order to build something new. That the art that only matters is new art, and in order to do it, we must blow up everything and build something new. This is a fundamental tenet of the avant-garde, right? and it's meant to be. And it's, if you read what their tenets are, they're pretty upsetting. I mean, they're anti-feminine, they're pro-war, um, they're about masculinity. It's a very interesting representation that at the heart of that, the avant-garde is a kind of toxic masculinity and a violence. So from that logic, the destruction of the trade towers on a sunny day when no one expected it, which is exactly what Stockhausen writes about, and no one was prepared for it, it was a great moment of art. Now, the other part is imagine growing up in Cologne, which was carpet bombed for years. That's where he grew up, and that's with no water, no toilet paper, no milk. What, what, what music does he write as a teenager, what, when, when the, the German radio is reconstituted after World War II, does he write La Vienna Rose? No, he doesn't write that. Does he write, you know, um, he can't. And so we, that's why I say we have to understand <laughs> what happens when composers write. But what do you say when someone says that, well, Les conducted Brahms, Les loved beautiful music, and so you're mischaracterizing his essence? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a really good one, because, because you see, in his heart of heart, just like, just like Schoenberg, there's this longing for beauty. You know, we have a, a philosopher named Theodore Adorno who said there's more uh, beauty in dissonance than in consonance, which doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, it's a completely Alice, Alice in Wonderland comment that there's beauty in, in what you would call ugly. After World War II, you can understand why it was just considered inappropriate to write beauty. And in the case of Boulez, he made a fortune by conducting most romantic music, starting with Wagner, because Vilhelm Wagner invites him to conduct Parsifal at Bayreuth, which I actually saw in 1966. Um, and Wagner can take it, can take this position, which is of clarity, of not roiling passion, because Wagner's music is contrapuntal. And by that I mean, for those of you who are not musicians, uh, you probably understand what a chord is, because everyone's played, you know, a guitar chord, or, you know, uh, or played the piano, and you see C major, you see F7. But that is a French invention, to think of music in terms of chords. The Germans wrote music so that all those chords are the result of inner melodies, right? So it's called counterpoint. So the bass goes like this, but the top goes like this, and the middle goes like this. And if you write like that, you can slow things down, and there's still a there there. You can speed things up, and there's still a there there. So Wagner could easily take the kind of dispassionate Boulez conducting style, which was no baton and a hand that chopped like this, and it was different, and it was revelatory. So he started a whole career in which he was doing the rain cycle, and then he was, became music director. 
of the New York Philharmonic. Consider that for a minute. Who was the music director before Pierre Boulez? Leonard de Bernstein. Could you think of anyone more opposite than Leonard Bernstein? And I remember sitting at the Philharmonic when Pierre was conducting Haydn, and when he said to me, is that really more in tune than when I conducted the Philharmonic? And I said, no. But, but it was just his, um, his uh, was a trademark. So, in a way, Pierre Boulez could justify his love for Ravel and Debussy by conducting the music as if he had written it. Right? Now think about that, because music depends on translators to exist. I write about that in my first book, in Meisters and Their Music. You see, a painting by Picasso is on the wall, and you can walk up to it, you can see it from a distance, you can spend five minutes with it, you can spend a lifetime with it, but you don't need a translator, right? You someone can tell you about it. But with music, the only way you can get from the beginning of Beethoven's symphony to the end of one is that somebody, and a lot of musicians, have to play it. You can't just open the book and say, oh, well, this is the Beethoven symphony, right? It depends on translation. So since all this music that Pierre Boulez theoretically hated and, and really was quite articulate about how awful his contemporaries were, he was able to find his way into even Brahms, who was maybe the worst of, of the people he hated, um, to, to Way to perform it, to translate it in a way that made it look like a direct line to him. Now, this is a kind of understandable thing, and I, I tell the story, I don't think in this book, no. Um, Andre Previn, you know, Andre died about a year ago, and Andre was one of the great musicians. I mean, he was, he was all, another Leonard Bernstein. He's a jazz musician, he's a composer, he can talk the most complicated work, the most beautiful work, he had won four Academy Awards. I mean, he's the one who conducts Gigi and My Fair Lady, the movies. And he said to me that when Pierre Boulez was the music director of the New York Philharmonic, he said, Pierre, I thought, you know, what should I conduct when I come guest conduct the Philharmonic? And Pierre said, well, you know, what do you want? He said, well, I'd like to do one of the big symphonies by Shostakovich. And Pierre Boulez said, as long as I'm a music director, I will protect the New York Philharmonic from Shostakovich. <laughs> and Andre said, Pierre, you're kidding. And then Andre said to me, he wasn't kidding. I mean, that's the kind of, ex that, was the, that was this weird power. John, if you um, could wave a magic wand, a, a magic baton, yeah. and you could decide what our classical musical scape was going to be from now on. What, say, three pieces would you be most interested in introducing the public to in a serious way? And what do you think we hear too much? What should be cleared away at this point? Well, thank you for that question. The way you're always supposed to answer a question that you really can't answer. So you say thank you for that question. Um, I do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a trick that you can all use next time someone asks you a question. And the reason why I can't answer that question is I don't know enough. I mean, there's so many thousands of pieces of music that are just names missing people. You know, if I say Egon Velish, you go, what language is John speaking here? Well, he was a composer. He wrote lots of symphonies, the first person to write a biography of Schoenberg. And if you go online and you can even spell Aegon Baelish and you listen to some of his music, you go, oh my god, that's really wonderful, that's extraordinary. How many composers are there? How many? It's hard to say. I could never say what three works, but I would say this. Um, you look at the announcements of new seasons coming up, like whether it's Carnegie Hall or whether it doesn't matter where it is, and you still see that the same patterns exist which is the standard repertory, which time kind of ends around 1925, starts around 1700. And why should it stop? Right? Plays didn't stop in 1930. Painting didn't stop. I mean, we're, we're, new musicals on Broadway didn't stop, God knows. And yet, we're living in a world where that link, that link from the 1990s to 1930s, think of Bolero as the last standard piece, maybe Shostakovich's fifth, 
you start to get into this kind of weird thing, like what happens after that um, to today. So I would say that I, I would not answer specifically. I would say every major institution, every major artistic director, every famous conductor, I mean really famous, multi-millionaire conductors who have power, singers, whoever they are, they need to champion this music. They need to say, okay, you know, I would like to hear this, or I, we should try this out. But you see what happens. You know, I don't want to pick on the Met or Carnegie Hall. I'm a New Yorker, so these are my local institutions. And so I love that, just like I love the New York Times, even though I, I, I write in the book a lot, quoting what the critics say as being inexplicable to me. But the, the Met is more likely to do a new production of Lucia de Lammermoor and set it today in a garbage dump as a way of presenting Lucia. And then we'll, then we'll produce a brand new opera in a certain style rather than produce Das Wunder der Helene of Kornbold, rather than Schwander, uh, Schwander the, the Bagpiper. There was a, 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 from the 1920s. There are operas from the 20s and 30s and 40s that we just don't ever hear in New York because, again, it's still held that we focus on the central repertory and try to do it in new ways to make it modern, which is irrelevant, which is more than irrelevant because you're smart. I once wrote a provocative article on me in which I said, let's try something new. Let's assume the audience is smart. <laughs> because, you know, we get it. You know, a, a, an opera that's set in medieval time is set in medieval times. It can tell us about us. We can see Tristan and Desolde, and it could take place in medieval time and know that it says something to us. You don't have to put it in, you know, today and in, well, in London. So actually, what ethically is wrong with Lutia and Lammermoor on motorcycles or something like that? Well, I mean, certainly you. it might bring younger people in more yeah. easily than having her standing there in the gown. Well, well the, 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 okay, what's wrong with that? As long as the music... I'll, I'll tell you what's wrong with that, because the concept of opera when it was invented in 1598 was to put all of the elements together to work together, not to fight each other, not to be provocative. I mean, the, this epicenter of this is Wagner, and the misunderstanding that Wagner was a revolutionary, and therefore, when we produce Wagner, we have to provoke the audience. Uh, but wait a minute, the revolutionary aspect of Wagner was that he believed that the scenery, and the color of the scenery, and the movement of the singers, and the words they were singing, and the music that was being played were all one thing. One of the famous lines that Richard Rogers said after uh, Oklahoma opened in 1943 was, you know, Mr. Rogers, why was Oklahoma, you know, why was it success? And he said, it looks like one person wrote it. And that's exactly right. And Wagner was, when he was writing his operas, he was the one person who wrote it. He wrote the words, the music, he orchestrated it, he supervised the direction and the scenery. He didn't want to set it in 1882 if it was Parsifal, which takes place in the mid -day. So when I conduct an opera and I look up on the stage, my job is for the color of the orchestra and the movement of the people on the stage to be congruent, not to fight each other. I mean, you, what is the point of that? Because that's the answer to your question. And whether young people come in to see Lucia with Lucia in you know, cut off jeans, I don't think that that actually is I, I don't know if there's data that would prove that, but let's think about this. Lucia de Lammermoor, because we're picking on that opera, takes place in Scotland. How many millions of ways can you design Scotland from the 18th century? The mist, the dark green shadows, the, the forests, the decaying castles, the, and using modern technology not to fight the story that's based on Walter Scott, but to amplify, why should she, why should Lucia not be that person at that time? I mean, yeah, you can do Julius Caesar and put it in Armani suits if you want, but there's nothing wrong with following what Donizetti had in mind. And anyway, Lucia is really about Catholics versus Protestants, which is a pretty good story. It sounds to me like what is now happening doesn't even tell that story, you see. So, so I, think, I think about continuity, from older periods to today, 
I also think about continuity within the thing called opera, because that's how we tell the stories. So you can do whatever you want, you can set it on the moon if you want to. But if you want the total impact of, of a music drama, it would seem to me you'd want all the elements to work here. John, you're making a revolutionary statement, because what you're saying is that the goal of art of this kind should not be to provoke. I get that, partly because I happen to be an aficionado of certain art forms that aren't about provoking, and I've always been kind of an old soul, but you're saying that art should not stimulate, it should not ruffle feathers, it shouldn't make people see things in new ways in too aggressive a fashion, that it should be about beauty and consonance, which would make perfect sense to just about any artist in 1700. But today, that is a really nervy statement. I get it, but I would present it very carefully to the world beyond some of us eccentric. I understand. Um, I'm not saying it shouldn't provoke. I mean, Lulu provokes. But the beauty of, of a production of Alban Berg's Lulu would be to design it beautifully. I mean, the behavior of the people in the, the liberal is provocative movement. enough. Pardon me. Is provocative enough? Absolutely. In fact, it's even more provocative when it's set, you know, with with you know uh, flowers and and um, staircases and people in, in beautiful. 20s. I mean, I mean, obviously, when Alvin Berg wrote it, he took an earlier two plays and he said it more or less in his own time because there's jazz. But it doesn't have to always look like a road company of cabaret to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it part of it, it. And the same thing is true about Traviata. I mean, she is a courtesan, which is a kind word for a whore. But you don't have to like put her in a red dress, which of course is ridiculous because any prostitute who wore a red dress or a red flower meant that she was not available for work at this particular time. So when uh, there's a production in which nothing on that stage has anything to do with why where you wrote it, but Bacchabiat is a great example of why there are ways that you could be so moved by that story, because she was a real person. Her name was Marie de Plessis. She died at age 23. She died at 23 in Paris when Verdi was in town with his, at that time, future wife. So the irony is that the very night that the real Traviata died, Verdi was in another part of Paris. And he learned about this story because a former lover of that woman, who was the son of Alexandre Dumas, who wrote about her. And then it became a play. And when Verdi heard about that play, because Traviata means somebody who strayed, a woman whose morality is straight, that's what Traviata means. He wrote this masterpiece opera because the woman he was living with, who he subsequently married, was considered to be herself a straight woman who had children out of wedlock. She was a, a former opera singer. He loved her for the rest of his life. His first wife had died. And so why do we care about La Traviata? Well, we could care about her because that real girl was sold into whoredom when she was 13 by her very poor father, because she was beautiful. I think everyone in this room, or anybody seen La Traviata, in which we, could, we can understand that. Let's say in the prologue, the prelude, we saw a little girl being taken by her father and being sold to some woman who puts her arm around her and takes her away. Well, that is a great way to inform you about why Verdi wrote the opera. You don't have to set it today. Just tell the story. I mean, that, by the way, is the line I always say to myself when I'm a little nervous, which I occasionally get. Just tell the story. <laughs> and John, actually, I'm going to insert something that I believe into this very quickly. If that's the way people are going to relate to La Trappe, then we're almost done. We would have to get past this idea that it has to be sung in the original language. It would have to be in English. Well, that would really do it. That's that true. It's a and very I really respect that. I think you would have fully got it. Before we end, I want to ask you one of those questions where, because we keep standing outside of our questions and answers, I want you to talk about something, which is that, is that one of the most touching things in this I saw is you know, the, <laughs> the trajectory of Arnold Schoenberg. Yeah. His artistic trajectory. He didn't only write variations for orchestra. Uh, talk about how we don't know as much about his music as we want. Well, I think Arnold Schoenberg, at the end of this book, 
I take four composers, four Austro-German composers of the 20th century. Kurt Weill, uh, Paul Hindemith, Arnold Schoenberg, and Eric Wolfgang Korngold. Now I take them because I had personal experiences and three out of the four with their families. And in all those four cases, as just emblematic of the, of the, of the journey, because this book took 30 years to write, um, I have, so at the end of the book, I, I do a personal thing about discovering these composers. And the last one is Arnold Schoenberg. Because anybody who studies music in the 20th century hears that name and knows that Arnold Schoenberg invented a tonality and then invented something called the 12-tone system. And that's music that most people don't like um, for whatever reasons, it, because of how the brain translates certain waveforms. See, this is where we get to the reality of what is ugly and what is beautiful. We have a way of hearing. An octave is an octave. You can't get away from it. 440 cycles a section. Second, 880, it's just the same note, just it's an octave higher. So we call it C and C or A and A. All right, and we break that up into 12 little notes and we don't need to get into that. So with Schoenberg, when he, he writes really extraordinary music as a young man, Mahler admires him, Strauss, and he, at some point in 1904, 1905, he goes through a personal crisis and he also moves, because he was so smart, into the logic that if music is gonna get more and more distended from tonality, what happens if you just get rid of it altogether? So he starts to experiment with what's called non-tonal music. And he goes through this period and he creates quite a sensation because it's very controversial because it has no bottom and no top. It has no journey. You don't know what that journey is. And when there are words, or, a, or if it's a pantomime or something like that, or a monodrama for people, you can kind of follow the drama, but the music doesn't do that. Okay, so then in 1922 or 23, he decides to control the beast and comes up with this system where you take the 12 notes, you order them in a certain way, so, you know, you know, so, you know it's whatever that is, and then you have these processes in which you can take the row, it's called the row, play it backwards, play it upside down, and upside down and backwards. And so now he has a system to control the beast. Well, this was, of course, shock horror to most composers. But then younger people, or certain people, thought, this is really interesting. Now, here's the funny thing. At the same time he's doing that and becoming really famous as the father of modernism, he starts to orchestrate the music of Bach. In other words, he needs that balance. And that's a little bit like Pierre Boulez, who never does that. Pierre Boulez climbs into Ravel and conducts it. Instead, we have Schoenberg orchestrating Brahms, orchestrating, uh, orchestrating a Bach. He, then he, of course, has to flee Hitler. He comes to America. And he lives uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Los Angeles, across the street from Shirley Temple. That already shocks people. Picture of Arnold Schoenberg in his morning scuffs, opening the screen door and getting the LA Times. Hello, Shirley. Hello, um, Shirley. But this is one of the extraordinary parts of that Los Angeles. And he starts to write music in keys again. He writes a suite in G major. He writes a theme and variation for college orchestras. Okay, so. It's great, interesting music. He also becomes a sculptor. He becomes a painter. He's leading a happy family life. Oh, well, that's the thing. So the war is over. Schoenberg dies in 1951. Now, here's the link to post-World War II. When the war is over, and you're a German or an Austrian or an Italian or whatever, you have to come to grips with the fact that there's four composers I mentioned before were still alive. They were not put in a camp, in camps. They were living in the enemy country called America. They were American citizens, and they had written music. What do you do with that? 
How does a German listen to the new symphonies by Paul Hindemith, written in America? What do Germans do with the, the musicals that Kurt Weill wrote for Broadway? And Korngold was living under palm trees. Mm -hmm. Son of a bitch, right? He's, in, he's living under palm trees, and we're living in a rubble. And Schoenberg, well, he must have been miserable because Americans never understood his music the way we understood his music. But when, there were, when Schoenberg's music was being played in Europe, there were riots, right? So, you know, so a whole rewriting of history starts to happen. And different criteria are created. And I, this is where, also where the book comes into why I'm writing. Kurt Weill sold out to Broadway. He just decided to give up all his good German credentials to write for Broadway to make money. Paul Hindemith taught at Yale, and he wrote so much music that's just dumb and repeat, repetitive, and he became a, kind of a boring professor. Schoenberg was miserable in LA because no one understood his music, and he had to retire from teaching and had no money, so he had, it was just awful. He didn't write enough music. And Korngold, well, we were always wrong about Korngold. He was always writing for Hollywood, even when he was living in Vienna. Okay, four completely different criteria with one conclusion. Don't play this music. So when you ask the question about Schoenberg, I, I was doing this series for Decca, the Antarctica Music series, and one of the composers who was degenerate and, and illegal was Schoenberg. So I said, let's do Schoenberg in Hollywood. I knew from Kitty Carlisle, um, that, you know, we're going into a little John's other life because she played Peggy Porterfield in On Your Toes in 1983. She took over for Dina Merrill. Uh, so, so Kitty says to me one day, well, you know, I dated George Gershwin and he proposed to me. And I didn't want him be Mrs. George Gershwin, she said, I was Kitty Carlisle. And she said, of course, he passed away six months later and I would have been really rich, she said. <laughs> <laughs> she did say. She said to me that, that George would play tennis with Arnold Schoenberg every week. Schoenberg would come over to the house on, on, uh, on uh, what is it, uh, uh, the drive in, in Beverly Hills, doesn't matter, um, and, and would play tennis uh, and then after tennis, there would be a lesson in which Schoenberg would teach George Gershwin the 12-tone system. And, and Kitty said he would put all this paper down on the floor and try to explain it to me. I had no idea what George was telling me about, but he was very excited. But I thought, well, wait a minute. This is a story that nobody knows. Usually you say, well, I like Gershwin, or oh, but I don't like Schoenberg, or I like Schoenberg, but I don't like Gershwin. But those two guys loved each other. And when George Gershwin died, who actually delivered the eulogy on national radio? Arnold Schoenberg. And in case you're curious about that, you can just go Arnold Schoenberg, Gershwin, eulogy, and you'll hear his voice. Really? Yeah. It exists? Yeah. It's just Thank out you. there. George Gershwin was one of these musicians. It's just wonderful. And at the end, and obviously, Schoenberg is so overwhelmed, he, his words get tripped up and he said, and may I just say on a personal note, um, his amiable, I will miss his amiable personality. But he said, there's no question, he was a great composer. Now, you listen to some of the music of Schoenberg that you never hear, right? It's because Boulez and his colleagues wanted music to always get more, more complex. And Schoenberg had given up the thing he invented because he didn't keep writing more complex music. In fact, he wrote 12 tone, but he also wrote things in G major. And that made him an apostate, and he was, in fact, then crossed out of history. Boulez wrote an article just after George Gershwin died saying, Schoenberg is dead. That was the headline in quotes. I mean, it had it all uppercase. So that's why we need to link this music up. This is why if you want, to, you know, I, I made a recording, but Boulez would never record the suite in G. It's just a wonderful piece. Um, and that's why I think that's what would link. Talk about young people. Link the music that was cut from us 
right today. And that's where young people will find that this music is relevant. Remember, what, three weeks ago, the score that won the Academy Award for best score to a picture was Hans Zimmer's score to Dune. Well, who's playing that? In point of fact, if you played Dune in a concert, you want to know when kids will come to a concert because the New York Philharmonic plays Dune by Hans Zimmer or The Batman or, you know, The Power of the Dog. But as long as we denigrate Hollywood, and that's the other point, and I'll, and I'll stop, is that Hollywood is just a, t a place where movies are made, like Berlin, like London, like Moscow, and during World War II and onward, Cina Cita in Rome, right? It's just another place where movies are made. After World War II, suddenly Hollywood and Hollywood music was all about venal, stupid, stealing people who do it for the money, who are not real composers. These were the same words that the Nazis used to denigrate Jewish composers during World War II. Why should we value Prokofiev's Lieutenant Kizia and not value Sunset Boulevard by Franz Waxman, who was trained in Dresden or Korngold or Steiner or Roja, who studied in Leipzig? These composers, these young composers fled and, and were saved because at first Hitler didn't want to kill Jews, he just wanted them out of the country. So where did they go? They went to Hollywood. They couldn't work in Germany, and Hollywood needed composers. I bet we've run out of almost run out of time. We can do a few audience questions. Yeah. 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 John, do you want to manage this? Um, I can do that. I, I can pass the mic if, if anyone. Yeah, no. Okay. You can. Go ahead. It just why did um, Boulez uh, want to protect the Philharmonic from Prestecoff? What was his reason? He didn't, think it was, he didn't think it was real music. He, was, he thought it was terrible music. It didn't fulfill. He didn't write twelve tone, and he was a living composer. You actually enjoy Shostakovich's music. Well, there might be that, but he but he thought that it was just vulgar and and, and it was of no interest to him. But I. That being absurd from his point of view. From my understanding of what he's saying is absurd. Yes. The second question I have is that the point of the comments, you want to know why um, music is stopped playing by 1925 here um, in Concert Hall? Yeah. But there's a profit motive here to start to bring in, I want to change my word, to bring in uh, an audience. You're going to have to play stuff like Beethoven. And Beethoven's night, and maybe throw in something odd now and then. But the candy is the traditional 19th century classical music that fills up uh, a venue, whereas the other modern stuff probably will not. That's exactly right. No, I agree with you, but the point is that, is that um, uh, you wouldn't have the modern stuff because there's a lot of stuff that that was irrelevant to the so-called modernism and futurism. See, the fact is that once you take the data pool and you, you remove it, you remove only those things that fulfill your de definition, you've left out all this other music. And this is huge amount of music. And just think about this, for the pops concert world and the classical music world, somewhere in between there's also a gigantic repertory of overtures and as it were light classical that used to be played that's not played at all. I mean, Toscanini used to end his concerts with an overture. He didn't end it with a big, serious symphony. He started with a symphony. And so there was an idea that the progress of a concert was to leave you having dessert after a wonderful meal, as opposed to getting your steak and potatoes and then sending you out in the night. So again, we have to just link, link this time. I agree with you. you. You want Beethoven, but you shouldn't have to stop. One of the only composers who's been added to the repertory in the past 50 years acceptable, besides Mahler in 1960, is now Rachmaninoff. When I was a kid, Rachmaninoff was considered third-rate Tchaikovsky, right? He was just repeating Tchaikovsky. And I remember when I was first teaching at Yale, I was in my 20s, some young man came in, he said, oh, Mr. Masseri, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. He sat next to me, I had the door open, because you always have the door open, and he said, I, I have something I have to tell you. I said, well, I don't know what that was going to be. I said, well, what is it? He said, I like the music of Rachmaninoff. So having been brought up as a Catholic, I granted him that solution, and I told him to go and sin no more. But no, I, I, 
I told him, that's okay. And now, now we, we somehow allow Brock to go up into the works. Another question? Somebody? Oh, Jamie. Well, mine isn't about the music, it's about your wonderful voice. Hello, John. Oh, I take it. It's a John. Is, is there an audio book? And please say that you are recording. Oh my God! Uh, there will be an audio book, and I'm not the voice. Oh, of it. well, that's a well, we, you can always write that letter. But um, the fact is that two, two and a half weeks ago, I had um, a polyp removed from my cohorts. Uh, it was a, a little vascular thing. This is a little too much information for the crowd, and I was not actually allowed to talk, which my wife rather enjoyed for about five days and then 10 minutes and then another 10 minutes. You know, I thought I could say, uh, my mother used to say John was vaccinated with a phonograph needle, and then I realized that there's no one on the planet who knows what that sentence means. <laughs> but I'm back and I'm talking. We are truly the beneficiaries of a wonderful evening. I can listen to you all night long. Thank you very much. All right, I guess that we done. We might be done. Is that it? Well, no music? Yeah. All right, thank you.